Hello, uh, good morning or good afternoon, I should say, and welcome to our very first live event open to the public. Um, I'm Kath Hughes, I'm the Head of Communication Services at uh, North Cumbria Integrated Care NHS uh, Foundation Trust, and this month is LGBT History Month. Um, joining me today is Professor Matt Phillips, who's an Associate Medical Director here at the Trust. He's going to run through um, a bit of a presentation about LGBT History Month, and if you have questions, please ch pop them in the chat box and I'll go to Matt at the end and we'll ask those at the end. So heading over to Matt now. Uh, thanks very much, Kath, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for uh, joining today. I'm Matt Phillips. I'm one of the Associate Medical Directors and I'm also a sexual health consultant. And I'm going to share with you some um, snapshots about LGBT history. It's too big to cover in 15 minutes, but I'm going to cover some bits that I find particularly interesting and I hope you will too. Uh, I very much hope that you'll um, take up my invitation to think about this and what it means for all of us. So you might even notice here on my first slide that after my name I've put my pronouns he, him, his. That's been a really recent development uh, and is really helpful if you wish to be a good trans ally because it helps to explain um, which pronouns are best. You might wonder why we're having History Month in February. It's for a very specific reason. In uh, the UK, we had something called Section 28, which meant that it was forbidden to teach about homosexuality in schools. Um, and that was repealed in 2003 in February. So this marks the event of that being repealed. But it also helps us understand why we need an LGBT History Month. If we rewind just 20 years, then we realise at that point it was illegal to, te to talk about homosexuality in schools. So if you were a child with two mums, two dads or a new form family, that couldn't be discussed and that's just 20 years ago. But I'm calling today from uh, Carlisle and what we're very fortunate about here is we have all our original ledgers um, from our very first patients and you can see there the number 1600 that's not the date we started that would have been a bit too far back but we're 102 and a half years old here in uh, Carlisle you'll see the original ledger it refers to a VD clinic so that's venereal diseases clinic at Cumberland Infirmary and you'll see on the page a little bit lower down the private register of patients although the first patient doesn't have the date they were seen here the second one does so we know that patients were being seen for sexual health here in uh, Carlisle from the 12th of October 1918 that's really significant 1918 so we didn't have antibiotics the first world war was still raging so really different times the NHS did not exist at that point um, so we've got a long history here. On this slide, um, it speaks a bit more to that history. So uh, 1916 and 1917, the government decided it wished to provide free treatment for sexual health, uh, mostly thought to be driven by the need to uh, look after soldiers returning from the battlefront. And so the government decided to provide free confidential treatment. Uh, the picture on the left is of the celebration I was lucky enough to attend at the House of Lords celebrating 100 years of sexual health. The bit on the right, really great. This is one of our original posters from up here where there were only two STIs described being syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, you'll notice if you look at the poster, it talks about lots of really uh, unpleasant outcomes, which is related to the fact that antibiotics were in their infancy. You'll also see that it really clearly describes that treatment is free, so that was still not a common thing. In fact, in sexual health services, we've existed at uh, about 30 years earlier than the NHS. Really important. You'll see that clinics were in Whitehaven Infirmary in the afternoon, and if you're a woman, you could go early afternoon and a man in the evening, because of course the men were at work, different day and age. The women were expected to finish work at two if they did have a job, because it was different jobs. So interesting snapshot of history for us here in uh, Cumbria. But I'm going to take us forward to this uh, symbol, uh, and some of you may be familiar with it. But if you're not, it looks quite innocuous, just a pink triangle. 
but this is the identity that was required in uh, Nazi Germany for people to be marked with if they were thought to be homosexual. And the punishment of that could include prison, labour or redistribution to concentration camps, hard labour, human experimentation and death in the concentration camps. So again, when we're thinking about why we might need an LGBT History Month, in the past 80 years, in Europe, which I know we've had Brexit, but this, we're still European, we're still holiday in Germany, you might have been forced to wear this. And being counted as homosexual could be as innocent as an alluring look to someone of the same sex. So it has been dangerous in modern times to be uh, an LGBT person. I'll bring us back to the UK and I'll fast forward to 1967 and this uh, Act of Parliament, uh, the Sexual Offences Act. Very interesting. Um, what it did allow was that for men over the age of 21 to be able to have um, homos have uh, sexual relationships in private. It's only referred to men and there's a bit of mythology around that because the original law that said that it was illegal uh, was written in Queen Victoria's time and it was widely held that she did not believe in uh, gay women and so it only referred to men. And in fact in this act you'll see at section 5 um, it refers specifically to men again. So 1967, so again, we're looking in the past 60 years, it was illegal here in uh, England to have gay relationships. So again, why are we exploring LGBT history? Because it's a very interesting part of society that has got the law looking quite intensely at it. I'm going to bring us forward another two years and this is the Stonewall Inn um, and moving us across the water to the US. What was important about the Stonewall Inn? It was essentially what we would refer to now as a gay bar. People could be free and easy. Um, however, it was subjected to a number of police raids uh, over the years. However, this particular event in 1969 um, marked a sea change in the US response to um, LGBT rights and the liberation of um, gay rights. It was a really um, difficult day. It was the 28th of June 1969, which was the date of Judy Garland's burial or funeral. Um, she was known as a gay icon uh, even back then and in fact one of the old-fashioned terms for being someone from the LGB community might be a friend of Dorothy referring to Judy Garland being in The Wizard of Oz but it had been her funeral so emotions were very high, uh, folks were out drinking and the police decided to raid. What happened next, it depends on which side of the story you might sit, some people call it the Stonewall Riot but some people call it the Stonewall Uprising, where there was a refusal to be oppressed and uh, the world changed after that. We have an organisation in the UK called Stonewall that still works for LGBT rights. Take us forward another few years, it's the 70s and uh, over in uh, San Francisco they're de uh, designing a logo for um, gay pride, which many of us are familiar with now. It's got six stripes on, it does resemble a rainbow. What you may not know is that each stripe represents um, a facet of uh, life. So green refers to nature and orange refers to healing and all of the colours have an important meaning. Um, and this has been widely adopted. But then I'm going to fast forward another few years to 1981 where sexual health, which is why I'm talking about this, really begins to work with LGBT history. The picture on the left is one of the first reports about uh, young men, young gay men dying of really rare pneumonias and dying of really rare infections that shouldn't be where they um, are. So this began to cause some concern. It was so obvious even in the early days that this was affecting only uh, gay men that the first name for this disease that we know so well now was gay related immunodeficiency. 
once the viral factor that caused it was identified, that was called human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. 1987, we're in Britain, and this is uh, very famously the tombstone advert, don't die of ignorance. So the same government that had put in that section 28 that meant you couldn't discover, uh, discuss um, homosexuality in schools was also the same government that realised just how important public knowledge was about this new disease. So whilst homosexuality couldn't be talked about in schools, there were leaflets coming through people's doors and um, television adverts, which probably helps us understand just how conflicted society was about things. If you want a really great um, digestible idea of what life could have been like back then, It's a Sin, which is showing at the moment, is a really great programme that addresses uh, being gay in the 80s in Britain whilst the AIDS crisis unfolded. LGBT history, we're now in the last 30, 40 years and we're looking at headlines like this in Britain, Britain threatened by gay virus, gays in fear. We can see just how oppressive the environment was when we look at the uh, shot at the bottom left hand side. I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, said Vicar. Well, what a terrible thing. But right next to it is the advert for funeral expenses. Think of the levels of oppression. I invite you to think about why it's really important to understand LGBT history. Luckily, uh, drugs began to be discovered that could treat HIV. This is called AZT or Zidovudine, which some of you may have heard of, really awful side effects. It was the first one, but began to extend uh, life expectancy. That has progressed greatly. But again, if you'd be interested in a media portrayal of what it was like in the early days with these drugs, you might want to watch uh, Dallas Buyers Club, which is an excellent depiction. Fast forward many years um, to 2010s and we've got really excellent drugs. People who uh, are diagnosed at the right time with HIV and who manage to take their medications will lead a long and healthy life and have the same life expectancy as someone without HIV. So it's all changing. But in the background, one of the big heroes in sexual health called Sheena McCormick was thinking, if these drugs can uh, help people living with HIV, what if they take them before they uh, enjoy sex? Will it prevent them getting HIV? And I personally was delighted to be involved as a recruiter in the Proud trial in Manchester, which demonstrated very clearly that uh, these drugs can prevent catching HIV in the first place, which has led further on to the IMPACT trial, which we took part in in Cumbria um, and which has now come to a close. That now means that through sexual health clinics, people can obtain drugs that will prevent them getting HIV. So the world has turned and for the better. All the time this is going on, we're thinking about communities and visibility and the, the need to be visible. We've got all these uh, lovely flags and I'll take you through them. The one with the black and uh, purple stripe, that's asexual pride flag. So that's those who uh, don't hold to any sexuality at all. The, the one in the middle, the, the uh, bright blue, bright pink is the bisexual visibility flag. So um, another community with uh, things that particularly affect it it um, as opposed to other communities. The flag on the right is lesbian visibility. Um, lots of pinks there, so we're still working a bit about um, traditional aspects, aren't we? When we think women must be allocated pink flags, but that's how this one is. We've got the transgender pride, which is both uh, blue, pink and white. That's our bottom uh, left one. And the one that's on the bottom right is bear pride, which is a subsection of the uh, gay men community that identifies as being different from the uh, rest of the community. So we've got lots of identities being explored. We still called LGBT History Month, but a, much, a longer um, abbreviation is LGBTQIA, which is lesbian gay, bisexual, trans, uh, Q is for queer or questioning, I is for intersex and A is for asexual or ally. 
brings me to my personally my favorite flag and you'll see it behind me in my office when we come to questions this is called the progress flag so we've got the traditional pride flag in the six um horizontal bars and then we've got an arrow that is meant to depict progress and it is called the progress flag so it's pushing forwards from the left to the right and this again is about inclusion of communities so the the colors represent communities of color that are marginalized and particularly marginalized um, when also dealing with um, issues of lgbt and we've got the uh, pink blue and white that form the transgender pride flag this flag is also said to encompass um, a representation of those living with HIV and those who we have lost to HIV and AIDS through the years. So I bring you to my last slide here. Um, 2019 so LGBT history in the last uh, two years. So it's not really history, is it? it's what's happening now. And I'm going to tell you this very sobering thing that the Colours in blue are countries where you are particularly protected in law. Um, if you are LGBT um, and the darker the blue, the more you are protected. The countries in white are those where there is patchy protection, which we note includes um, the USA. Those in oranges and yellows are countries that specifically remove protections and punish LGBT. And those in red are those where you can be put to death for uh, the crime of being LGBT. So when we ponder collectively, why do we need an LGBT history month? It's because we're still living in that history. It's still not, the world is still not a safe place. And for the very act of being same sex attracted, you may be put to death in some countries. So it's not a history. What I'd like to close us with are a couple of thoughts about what could be an LGBT future because part of the future happening is us imagining it here today and I've got two particular hopes for LGBT future. The first is an end to HIV infections and in the uh, UK we're working towards a goal of 20 by 2030 there will be no new HIV infections. We're working really hard uh, on that in Cumbria and we're well online to achieve that through a number of um, interventions. So we might be imagining an LGBT future that sees the end of that plague that we've seen the tombstone for. But I imagine that maybe an even brighter future, a future where we can get rid of the closet, where it's just acknowledged that every human has got a right uh, to have a lived identity and a right to have a lived sexuality, where people don't have to come in to out of a closet because they were never in a closet. The closet is gone and it's just acknowledged that we're all humans, um, all trying to do the best with our lives. And that there is a future where we don't have to identify people solely by their sexuality. And with that, I hope I've given you some food for thought. I'm just going to pull my slides down and uh, refocus the camera and I'd be delighted to take questions. Thank you uh, for listening. Lovely, thank you very much, Matt. So we do have a couple, of, a couple of questions and I'd just like to invite those of you who are on the call, if you've got any questions, just to pop it in the chat box and I can pose those directly to Matt. Um, the one that we, we've had one in that's asking, what, what changes do you think still need to be made to make the UK a more inclusive place? So we've talked about the history, but what do you think um, changes still need to be made? So uh, thanks very much for that question. I love it. It's, it's how can we uh, influence the future? I think the most important duty for all of us is to notice when we're in a situation where people aren't being included. And if we begin to notice, it means we can set out the invite more to include people in. So the changes that need to be made are for each of us to have a duty to notice why I'm in a room with only people of um, a particular group? Why am I in a room with people only of a particular gender? And I think BL Black Lives Matter has helped us think about that. Why am I in a room with people of only a single ethnicity? I think to make the UK more inclusive, we just all need to kindly question each other and say, have we invited everyone? Not only have we invited them, have we put out the red carpet to make them welcome? 
And so that that really led on to the next question quite nicely, actually, Matt, is, is it what are people listening today? What can they do differently as an individual, as a person? And so you talked a little bit there about questioning. Is there anything else that you think uh, would would be good takeaway for people, really? I th um, a great takeaway from me is, well, even coming here is an act of engaging with the topic, which is great. E engage with the topic. Think about how rich um, everything could be that we do when we include people and help others understand the reasons. Sometimes get asked, why is there an LGBT History Month? And I hope I've helped us to explore why there is still a need to talk about the history and to celebrate it in particular. It's about throwing off the, the um, oppression that has been in the past and the current oppression as we saw in that world map. So um, what I'd really love to know is if this talk has invited any of you to chat just to the person next to you when you next sat down and you have a few minutes to chat about how, how to get the world to where we want it to be. OK, great. So I've got a few other questions coming in. I'm just going to have a look at those now and try and pull those together. A couple on the same topic um, about what can employers do? So what can employers like NCIC do to make the working environment more inclusive? And then also uh, good, good presentation, Matt, good to hear your views on changes, but how do you propose we make specific changes in, in here and in the trust? So that's about employers really and here in the trust too. Uh, thanks very much. So a couple of things. Um, I think well, one of the wonderful things to notice is that NCIC has sponsored this talk. So there's clearly the uh, trust is really keen to understand and to help it. There's a visibility. We can see behind me the progress flag and I've got the uh, lesbian visibility flag. I've got all sorts of flags here. So part of what can be done is just to really signal you are welcome. You don't need to hide anything particular. You are welcome. And I think the trust is trying to do that. And there is an LGBT staff network. And if you really want to contribute, then folks are very welcome to join that network, either as someone who identifies as LGBT, but as someone who identifies as an ally. So uh, the thing is to, to say what you'd like um, uh, and to understand that today is a really clear indication the trust has got open ears. OK, thank you. And sort of related to that, and you touched on it there, how can allies within NCIC support our LGBT colleagues and clients further? Because of course, it's not just about um, our staff, but it's also about uh, patients who who uh, see seen in our services. So I think that the allies, as you've said, are welcome in, in our uh, staff networks that you've talked about. Is there anything else particularly around um, clients that we can look at? Uh, sometimes um, it's just important to try and use inclusive language. Allyship is a difficult topic and it's best understood through the lens of those who um, want allies, so such as on my first slide, I put my personal pronouns to to um, be a good ally to uh, transgender um, folks. So if you wish to be a better ally in that respect, so allyship is an in-depth thing. Have the conversation with someone who you trust in a respectful way to and ponder what, how can I be a better ally? That's my advice. Great, thank you. I've just got one more question that's come in and it's about, do you think there will ever be a cure for AIDS? Ah, the million dollar question. My dream is that there might be. And in fact, what I have noticed in my work as a sexual health doctor is in the last past few years, there are actually conferences looking for the HIV cure, which probably wasn't there 15 years ago. It was just about how to treat HIV. Do I think so? I'm going to say I hope so, but I don't know. And if I'd have been the doctor in 1987, helping people with AZT to just live an extra year, whilst there are tombstone adverts everywhere, I might have said no. So the future can be whatever we imagine it to be. So let's imagine that there will be a cure and let's work towards it. But I don't know yet. I hope so. 
Lovely, thank you. So, and I've got another one actually. Um, do you feel like the transition to not having the closet at all has begun, or do you think it's still a long way to go? I think there's a long way to go, um, and it, it depends. There's pockets of population, aren't there? So, in in some pockets, it really has disappeared. And certainly, speaking to um, younger people they they take a different notice of each other's sexuality it seems to be a bit less interesting to some of the younger people i talk to so society is changing slowly it'll be a, a while though i imagine yeah i'm asking being asked a lot of deadlines here kat i'm i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not up to scratch <laughs> look into, but i hope look so. into your crystal ball uh look into your crystal ball um so that's great i think i've re i've learned a real lot today and i think that's uh, really important that's what this event is all about it's about raising awareness looking back at the history and i know 15 minutes to cover 100 years um is is short so i'm sure we will share this event still so people can watch it back uh, so top point people to it send it to your colleagues um as matt had said in the trust if you're a trust employee we do have an lgbt staff network and there's a meeting about that right after this um which we'll put out on our social media feeds if somebody's interested in in, in joining that um and i do believe that if you're a trust employee as well we have uh, training taking place later this month as well which people can access which i think is another way in which you can become an ally or if, if you identify with those communities you can join those too so um, thank you very much your feedback for the event would be really welcome we're looking at doing awareness events um, throughout the course of the year this is the first one that we've done so if there's any topics that you'd really like us to cover drop us a line into the communications help desk so thanks very much for your time and hope to see you again next month